All right, and now the reason you have showed up this morning. I'd like to introduce our huddle speaker, Aaron Coe. Aaron is the director of the Palmer Museum of Art and an associate clinical professor in the College of Arts and Architecture. She was appointed director of the museum in September of 2017, and she has worked on establishing the vision and strategic direction for the Palmer Museum, including its collection and exhibition program, and oversees the planning and implementation of the museum's mission and goals. She is at the forefront of the university's proposed initiative to construct a new university art museum at the Arboretum. Co is the former director of the Hyde Collection, an accredited art museum and historic house located in the capital region of New York. She led a major capital project there that included an expansion of and renovations to the museum's 1989 wing. Moreover, she secured a major gift of post-war post -war modern art that resulted in the addition of a new gallery dedicated to modern and contemporary art that opened in June of 2017. Prior to serving as director, Co was the museum's chief curator for 15 years. She has curated more than 40 exhibitions, authored over a dozen publications, and, con and contributed to the national arts periodicals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome today's huddle expert, Erin Co. Wow, what an introduction. Paul, thank you so much. And for the warm welcome from all of you. I also want to give a thanks to Michelle Moore and the Alumni Association for inviting me to address you about the Palmer Museum of Art and the vision for our future home in the Arboretum at Penn State. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this morning on game day. Go Nittany Lions. <laughs> right? <laughs> And today I am joined by my colleague, Robin Seymour. She, uh, Robin, <laughs> everyone knows Robin, right? Do I <laughs> need to say more? She's the major gift officer for the New Art Museum project. So if you have questions about the campaign or want a pamphlet, please see uh, Robin. Also today, Amber Krieg is in the room. Amber, hello. <laughs> Amber is the museum's associate director of museum membership and donor relations. Amber, thanks for being here today. Um, and again, um, thanks to all of you. I'd like to dedicate my presentation this morning to all of the people who have already generously stepped up to support the new Art Museum project. And some of you are in the room with us this morning. And I just want to extend my heartfelt thanks because this is a big job, it's a bold vision, that Dr. Barron has for a cultural destination at Penn State, but it's gonna take all of us to support it. And when I'm surrounded by people who believe in this as much as I do, I can't tell you it motivates me, it propels me forward onto great things, onto a great future for Penn State, because that's really what this project is about, is the future. So by a rise, show of hands, how many of you have been to the Palmer Museum of Art? All right, so I'm really speaking to the, the hometown crowd. So even though it looks like you're mostly familiar with the museum, just in case you're not yet familiar, I'm going to take about the first 15 minutes of my presentation to review the mission of the museum and the role of the museum here at Penn State and in the broader community. So I always start my presentations on the Palmer um, with an overview of the museum's purpose. Why are we here? The Museum of Art at Penn State was established in 1972 to serve the land grant mission of the university and its teaching, research, and public service. Though that is first and foremost. Specifically, if we want to drill down to our mission, the museum serves as a cultural, educational, and scholarly resource for the university and audiences from Pennsylvania the nation, and the world. We achieve this through an array of thought-provoking exhibitions and engaging programs to encourage critical thinking, inspire curiosity and creativity, and foster respect for diverse cultures and points of view. And our goal is to reach every student at Penn State and to be the preeminent cultural destination. The goal 
The goal to serve as a cultural destination is outlined in the university's strategic plan under the thematic pillar of advancing the arts and humanities at Penn State. Now let's just take a quick overview of some of the key components of our operations. So I'm gonna just review these bullet points with you. First and fo foremost, we're a free admission museum. <laughs> uh, that's not something a museum in this country can say every day. I think many of you know that. We have 11 galleries. We organize nine, actually this year, 10 <laughs> special exhibitions each year. We attract 35,000 visitors to the museum each year. 35% of our visitors are Penn State students. We serve 3,000 K through 12 students uh, in the Center County region and surrounding areas. And we offer over 100 programs annually, and these are gallery talks, pop-up exhibitions, gallery tours, lectures, community programs and events, the list goes on and on. We serve as a critical connection between town and gown. We are a public-facing organization, and the Palmer has a great relationship with the community. And I want to thank so many of you here in the room, our members of the museum. You're our friends, and I want to thank you for your support. Also in the room today, we have some of our amazing docents. These are our volunteers who give tours of the museum's collections. And so when you come by the museum, these are the very friendly and informative people that you may encounter in our gallery. So I want to thank them for all they do for the museum. And we have, we steward a collection of 9,600 works of art and counting that span from antiquity to the present day and represent a range of cultures and geographic regions from around the world. The size of the collection makes the Palmer Museum of Art the largest art museum between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Did you know that? And the largest university art museum in the Commonwealth. I think that's something to be, feel proud about, don't you think? So I'm going to talk a little bit with you about the permanent collection, because understanding the permanent collection, the number of objects in the collection, the outstanding quality of the collection is integral to understanding why we need the new art museum. The museum is nationally recognized for its high caliber collection of American art that forms the core strength of the museum. About half of our holdings are comprised of American art, with strengths in late 18th century art and 19th century landscape, portraiture, still life, and genre painting that are on view if you visit this weekend, perhaps, in the Snowist Galleries. We also have great strengths in American art of the first half of the 20th century, specifically American realism and modernism, and we are especially strong in the Ashcan School, the Eight American Painters, and Stieglitz Circle Modernists that are on view in the Hull Gallery. And when you're there, you don't want to miss our latest addition to the collection from the bequest of Barbara Palmer, one of the greatest works by Georgia O'Keeffe, is now on view in the galleries. So thanks to Barbara Palmer and her bequest, which has really transformed the museum's collection. The bequest included 200 works of art, mostly American art, which was the focus of Jim and Bob Palmer's collecting interests. We also have a growing collection of post-war modern and contemporary art, and a small portion, I should tell you, because modern and contemporary art tends to be very big. <laughs> have you noticed that? <laughs> so we have, I would tell you, a very small portion of that collection is on view in two galleries in the museum. Now, other areas of strength, let's take a step back in time, uh, are on view in the Harris Gallery, and this is our outstanding collection of Baroque paintings. We also have an international collection of ceramics that spans world cultures from ancient to modern, and you're seeing the ancient pieces in the slide, and a fast-growing collection of, mo of contemporary uh, modern ceramics, and a really fast-growing collection of international contemporary studio glass. 
The Palmer Museum began actively acquiring studio glass starting in 1999 with the gift of a major Chihuly C-form piece that you see in my slide right here. It's on view in the museum. Today, just in the last year alone, we've acquired about 100 pieces of studio glass. Today, we have about 150 pieces, and we anticipate receiving 300 more pieces as promised gifts. These will be gifted to the museum in the years ahead. So watch out, Corning. <laughs> You're getting some competition in State College. And if you stop by the museum, you will enjoy seeing a brand new installation of our studio glass collection, which we just unveiled in the Tonkin Gallery, along with a new installation of our ceramics collection. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about our exhibition program. The Palmer Museum has a distinguished history of organizing groundbreaking exhibitions. As our recent blockbuster show, how many of you saw Plastic Entanglements, Ecology Aesthetics Materials? Wonderful, great, thank you. Um, this show, as you know, was uh, achieved record-breaking attendance. It was a groundbreaking exhibition for us. It featured 60 works by 30 international contemporary artists who engage with plastic as medium and as message about the growing global crisis of plastic pollution. And I credit the success of this exhibition with the collaborative spirit that defined it from its inception. This exhibition, as many of you know, became entangled with Penn State through partnerships and collaborations we developed with over 30 entities across the university to organize dozens of programs that accompany this multifaceted exhibition. And by doing so, we achieved not only record-breaking attendance, but we demonstrated in a big way that the museum has an essential, it is an essential resource for the students and faculty at Penn State, the local community and beyond. The exhibition is now on a national tour. It was previously on view at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon in Eugene. And this past spring and summer, it was on view at the Smith College Museum of Art in Northampton, Mass. Have any of you seen it at either of those venues? Yes, good, thank you. Here's Joyce Robinson, one of the curators of the show, uh, giving a gallery talk um, at the Smith College when it opened there. Uh, Joyce curated the show with Jennifer Wagner Lawler, who is faculty right here in the College of Liberal Arts um, at Penn State. The exhibition recently opened to the public at the Chazen Museum of Art at the University of Wisconsin, another Big Ten university. And I'm, yeah, <laughs> yay, Ma yay, Madison. And I'm heading out to Madison, by the way, next week for the opening festivities of Plastic Entanglements. Keep this in mind, at each venue, when we travel shows, which we do, at each venue for Plastic Entanglement, it traveled on the West Coast, the East Coast, to the center of this country. The exhibition is accompanied by the tagline organized by the Palmer Museum of Art at Penn State. And this gets picked up in all of the editorials, in all of the calendar listings, all of the reviews of the exhibition, of which there's been many, including a great review of the show in the Boston Globe. This fall, for those of you who are here on campus, I hope you stop by to see four of our exceptional exhibitions on view at the museum again this fall. They certainly reward repeat visitations. Leading the way is Augusta Savage, Renaissance Woman. This is a groundbreaking exhibition that offers the first extended study of this Harlem Renaissance artist. The exhibition was organized by our friends at the Cummer Museum of Art in Jacksonville, Florida, and is on a national tour. Augusta Savage was an artist activist and an educator who advocated for recognition of African Americans in the arts. She played an instrumental role in the, in the development of many celebrated African American artists, including Romare Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, Norman Lewis, um, whose works are also featured in the exhibition. We decided this fall to expand on the theme of the power and spirit of pedagogy and make it the leitmotif of two other exhibitions, including The Web of Life, John Biggers, and The Power of Pedagogy, which examines the work of the acclaimed muralist and teacher John Biggers, who spent his formative years at Penn State earning three degrees in art education. His mentor at Penn State was the influential art educator Victor Lowenfeld. 
And it's a fascinating story told through a selection of works in our collection and a majestic mural that you see in my slide that is on loan to us from the Paul Robeson Cultural Center. The theme of pedagogy continues with the presentation of Bauhaus transfers, Albers Rauschenberg. This exhibition pairs a work by Joseph Albers with a monumental print by Robert Rauschenberg. Rauschenberg was a student of Albers between 1948 and 49 at Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And this dialogue between these two seminal works is presented in conjunction with an international symposium on the centenary of the Bauhaus that's been organized by the Department of Ar um, Architecture and the Department of German Studies here at Penn State. And both works are on loan to us from the Philadelphia Museum of Art as part of a collection sharing program that is supported by the Art Bridges Foundation and the Terra Foundation for American Art. Now from the world of the artist educator to the world of the artist etcher, our fourth exhibition this fall is Fantasy and Reality, the World According to Felix Buho, which provides an unprecedented opportunity to examine the work of one of the most original French printmakers in the late 19th century. This exquisite and evocative exhibition that features 40 exceptional examples of Buho's masterful arsenal of techniques was guest curated by Jim Goodfriend. He's here in my slide. Jim is the world's leading authority on Felix Buho. Now I want to segue here for a moment to talk about student engagement because student engagement is a top strategic priority for the museum. To fulfill our educational mission and goal to reach every student at Penn State, we need to provide transformative experiences for our students. And the Palmer has a role to play as a defining piece of a Penn State education. And guess what? Students provide a unique voice that is imperative if a university art museum is going to remain relevant. So we are bringing student participation and student perspectives into the practice of the museum as a whole. To that end, we have launched several new student engagement initiatives under the guidance of our fabulous new educator, Brandy Breslin, including the Palmer Student Ambassadors, or PSAs as we call them. This is the first student volunteer group at the museum. This fall, we have 18 students in the program, and they receive training to give short tours of the museum to visitors and to be a student presence at the Palmer. They also provide programming ideas, and they assist us with, their, with the programs as well. So programs like Community Day or our Family Days. And they also assist us and provide ideas for our new student engagement initiatives, including Art After Hours. This is a new program. These are held once a month. We keep the museum open late with programs designed specifically with students in mind, but that are open to everyone. And th just this September, we had our first one for the fall, and the theme was art, activism, and social change around the themes of the fall exhibitions. Class visits, just briefly, class visits to the, the museum have increased significantly over the past year. We are now getting involved with classmen, not just with upperclassmen, but all years at Penn State. We have collaborated with various units outside of the College of Arts and Architecture, which has been very successful in bringing students and faculty from diverse disciplines into the life of the museum. And you can see my list here, all of the other colleges and departments that we are working with to bring students into the museum. A word on graduate students and interns. Each semester, the Palmer Museum has graduate students and undergraduate interns who work at the museum. This semester, we have eight students, five graduate assistants and three undergrads, working on various collections projects, uh, educational programs, and marketing projects within the Palmer. These students receive on-the-job training and professional development while honing research skills, writing, and public speaking skills. And at the same time, they're making a meaningful contribution to the museum. Graduate students, by the way, who have worked at the Palmer Museum have gone on to jobs and or fellowships at, are you ready for this? The Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Portland Museum of Art, Harvard Art Museum, the J. Paul Getty Museum, and Princeton University Art Museum, just to name a few. Now, for the moment you've all been waiting for, the New Art Museum. I'm gonna to talk, to spend the rest of my presentation discussing uh, this strategic um, initiative. 
Now that I've set the table, now that you can appreciate the impact of the museum here at University Park and on a national stage, and the value that the museum brings to Penn State and its students, let's take a closer look at our need for the new art museum. So first, some historical perspective. The Museum of Art at Penn State was established, as I mentioned earlier, in 1972. The original building on Curtin Road was designed by Tafani Fox. It's a, it was a functional, kind of no frills, modernist building with three galleries and really no room for the growing collection. This building on Curtin Road was transformed in 1993 with the Charles Moore edition that we know today. It was renamed the Palmer Museum of Art in recognition of a leadership gift made by our great benefactors, Jim and Barbara Palmer. Now, in 1993, when the Palmer Museum opened its doors, there were 3,500 works of art in the collection. Today, we are close to 10,000 works of art. And though the collection has expanded by 150%, the footprint of the building has not expanded one square inch. Right now, we can only exhibit less than 4% of the permanent collection in the galleries. And as the collection grows, guess what? That number drops, <laughs> right? As the collection gets bigger, what we have on view gets smaller. In the new museum, our goal is to expand this to as much as 8%. So we want to try and double that number and put the University Art Museum at Penn State on par with our colleagues. Most museums in this country have closer to 7 or to 8% of their collection on public view. So as you can see, we are bursting at the seams. <laughs> the building is at maximum capacity. And we have a pipeline of donors, including many Penn State alums, who intend to gift their collections to us in the not too distant future. So the time has come to expand and build a new university art museum of and for the 21st century. Just as an example, in the next five years, we anticipate the collection will grow based on these promised gifts by 30%. So again, the time has come. In the fall of 2022, we will mark the 50th anniversary of Penn State's art museum and we are hoping to celebrate this milestone in our new state-of-the-art facility in the Arboretum. Now, the goal to create a new art museum for the Palmer stems from this 2016 feasibility study conducted by the university, ordered by President Barron, to assess the potential vision of a consolidated cultural district, as Dr. Barron envisioned, as he envisioned it as a complex of museums, including interdisciplinary galleries and education spaces that would position Penn State and central Pennsylvania as a unique arts and culture destination. The feasibility study that I'm showing you was completed by Ayers St. Gross, again, in 2016. How many of you are familiar with this document? Okay, so some of you are aware of this. Okay, so this plan, I guess my point here is it goes back. <laughs> it goes back to 2016. So this expansive and all income encompassing vision that Dr. Barron had was to com is to combine all of the Penn State Museum collections under one roof and to elevate the integration of science and the arts to a new level and to also increase the impact and reach of Penn State academics and research to a broader public. So the plan as described in this document incorporated the Arboretum's master plan with the addition of a conservatory, a planetarium, and the inclusion of 30, excuse me, and the inclusion of collections of the 20 museums and galleries dispersed across campus that represent 15 colleges and departments. Wow, right? That's a bold vision. The result, an unprecedented interdisciplinary space and program. Once this project was completed, this cultural district, the total build out was projected in the feasibility study to attract 350,000 visitors each year and, that, and it would require, again, according to the feasibility study, 230,000 square feet of exhibit space, gallery space, education state space, and support space. It was broken out into three phases, this bold, ambitious project for a cultural district at Penn State. 
And in the three phases, the interdisciplinary galleries or the interdisciplinary gateway was in phase one. Okay, phase one of the project. Phase two was the STEM museum or the bringing the science museums at Penn State together under one roof. The conservatory and the planetarium were also in phase two. And in phase three was the art museum. So this was the plan I was handed when I interviewed for this position in April of 2017. And what we've done since I've been here, since September of 2017, is we we've flipped the phasing and we're starting with the highest strategic priority, which is a new home for the Palmer. And then later phases of this project would incorporate interdisciplinary galleries, planetarium, conservatory, and STEM museum. Now some of you, I'm sure, have heard the news. That's why you're here today, right? In May, the Board of Trustees of Penn State approved proposed plans for a new art museum at the Penn State Arboretum. Here's just some of, some of the clippings that this news received, including a great article that appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, Pittsburgh Gazette, in addition to other art world news media outlets, and then local news. Let's take a high level view of this project. This is a drone view of the site and existing conditions at the Arboretum. The new museum will be located in this open area adjacent to the H.O. Smith Botanic Gardens and along Bigler Road. Now in the same press release that was issued in May, it also announced that the Board of Trustees had selected the architect for this project and the architect is Allied Works. So we have the site, we have the site boundary, and we have the architect, right, all announced in May. So let's talk about Allied Works. I want to make sure you're all very familiar with the architect. The firm was founded by this gentleman, Brad Clofield, in 1994 in Portland, Oregon. And Brad opened a second office in New York City, in, right in Man downtown Manhattan in 2003. Allied Works was selected based on their extensive experience in the design of art and education facilities, specifically Allied Works brings 25 years experience in museum design and research. And we also selected them because their approach to architecture is strongly interdisciplinary, research-based, and highly collaborative. These qualities made them a good match for Penn State and our we are culture. Allied Works is internationally recognized for innovative arts, cultural, and civic buildings, including academic museums and art schools in higher ed, and for creating carefully curated campus environments. Specifically, and what really attracted me about uh, Allied Works, is they are known for architecture that is responsive to site, to place, to nature, and to the broader campus community. Because this is a unique project, and it's a challenging one, so it was so important that we found the right architect. Do you know that this will be the only university art museum in a full-scale arboretum in the United States? That alone will make it a cultural destination. People will come just because of that. And of the two dozen other firms that we invited to submit proposals for the new architect, for the new art museum, excuse me, it was Allied Works and Brad Clofield that most closely aligned with the goals of this project. So right now, I'm going to take you quickly through some of Brad and his team's um, other museum projects. So we're going to take a quick look. Uh, first, starting with the Contemporary Art Museum in downtown St. Louis. This was completed by Allied Works in 20, 2003. Uh, it's a two-story facility comprised of two intersecting ribbons of concrete and steel that define the volume and space and create a series of these large interconnecting galleries to showcase contemporary art. And just a word here about Brad's sort of design philosophy when it comes to art museums. So if Brad were here, this is what he would tell you. He would say that he creates beautiful spaces for showing art. Brad doesn't want the architecture to detract from the experience of appreciating and being at one with the work of art. This is very important to him and one of the reasons that we hired them. In 2007, they completed a major renovation and expansion of the Seattle Art Museum. Have any of you been there? 
I think I know the Caicoses were there recently. <laughs> this included the design of a street level open lobby known as the Forum, a monumental space and a gateway to the collections of the Seattle Art Museum. Um, Allied Works in 2008 completed the Museum of Arts and Design, formerly known as the American Craft Museum, which now sits on Columbus Circle in Midtown Manhattan. Brad designed a textured uh, facade of glazed terracotta and fritted glass to materially express the museum's mission of honoring the craft tradition in art and design. And how, and how many of you have been there or seen this on Columbus Circle? But the museum, like, doesn't it animate Columbus Circle? It really brings it to life, right? It, it is one of, and as you know, it is one of the most prominent public spaces in New York City. Are you ready for this? In 2009, how appropriate. <laughs> on game day, they completed a renovation and expansion of a Big Ten University Art Museum, the University of Michigan Museum of Art. But we won't hold this against them, will we? <laughs> Their design of the addition doubled the museum's collection, exhibition, and education program. They significantly lightened the building envelope and allowed access to a common area at the ground level. The addition includes three gallery wings that radiate from a central atrium that you see here in my slide, right there. And overall, Allied Works helped the University of Michigan's Museum of Art create a more accessible museum, a more welcoming museum to students and the community. And guess what? Today, this museum attracts a quarter million visitors annually. Next up, Brad designed the Clifford Still Museum in Denver that opened its doors in 2011. It's a monographic museum devoted to one of the key figures of the abstract expressionist movement. The building has received widespread critical acclaim. Um, it's been the recipient of numerous awards, including the highest award given by the American Institute of Architects. And their most recent museum project is the National Veterans Memorial Museum in Columbus which opened a year ago to great acclaim. It has already achieved iconic status and was recently named Ohio's best designed building. The museum is dedicated to remembering all veterans from all conflicts and it was the vision of Senator John Glenn who worked closely with Brad on the design of the building before his death in 2016. It combines building and landscape in one simple elegant gesture that seems to organically rise from the earth. It's an engineering marvel constructed from 28 million pounds of concrete with a glass curtain wall system and spiral procession that ascends to a rooftop sanctuary. According to Brad, the design serves as a symbol of our nation's veterans and how their strength emanates from within. Allied Works is partnering with the landscape architecture firm of Reed Hildebrand. They are based in Cambridge and their design practice is focused on museum landscapes and academic campuses throughout North America and Europe. They have received more than 70 design awards for their work. And here is just a short list of some of the projects that they have worked on, excuse me, um, that, are, are, that resonate with our project. Now I want to quickly take you through the goals for the New Art Museum project. So let's all get on the same page about what are the key goals here. So number one, we want to fulfill and expand Penn State's land grant mission of teaching, research, and service for the students of the university, for audiences across Pennsylvania, the nation, and the world. The Art Museum the Ar and the Arboretum will serve as a cultural destination that produces an economic impact in Center County and in State College and helps fuel the local economy. I mentioned earlier, one of the key goals is increased exhibition space. We want to grow that from our current less than 4% in our 12,700 square foot uh, ga exhibition galleries. We want to grow that to as much as 7 to 8%. And in the new museum, we're projecting at least 21,000 to 22,000 square feet for gallery space. One of the other key goals of this project is integration with the Arboretum. We want to be integrated with the Arboretum and not detract from it. The museum will enhance the overall sense of place of the Arboretum while retaining its unique identity as an art museum and serving as a cultural destination. We want the museum to be inviting 
to be welcoming and to be accessible to all. And for many of us, that means having parking. <laughs> As many of you know, the museum does not have adjacent parking. So this is a big issue, you know, this is a critical issue for the museum with our visitors. We are really not fully accessible, but we will be at the new museum. We want to enhance the visibility, visitorship, and guest experiences for the art museum and for the Arboretum. We want the new art museum to be a place for Penn State students, an educational resource, a creative hub, where they get to expand their skills and enhance their experience at Penn State. We, want to ex we already have a great relationship with the community, but we want to strengthen that relationship. We want to expand and enhance it, uh, that connection we have between town and gown. Stewardship, of course, we're going to design a building that is in, a, is in accordance with the highest professional standards of our field, and that's going to preserve Penn State's art collections for future generations to come. And of course, sustainability is another key goal of this project. And in keeping with Penn State's commitment to environmental su sustainability, this museum will be a high performance building and it will at minimum um, receive um, LEED certification. Now let's just quickly review the museum space program. So what are we talking about with this museum? What's its shape and size? What's going to be inside? It's going to be a freestanding art museum of approximately 68,000 to 74,000 square feet. Now, you'll notice there's a difference between the size, right? So it, this depends on fundraising. So right now, the university has committed funding that would get us to a 68,000 square foot facility. But if we can raise the $13.9 million, if we can get to that goal, of 85 million, we will be in a 74,000 square foot facility, and that's what we need. Because if we don't raise that money, we have to start making sacrifices and, and, and trimming the program. We're looking at exhibition galleries of 21,000 square feet, as I mentioned earlier, special exhibition, American art, European art, galleries for Asian and African art, for our ceramics collection, for our studio glass collections, works on paper gallery, and a teaching gallery. We're going to have education spaces in the new museum, including an object study room, classrooms, and an exploration space for children and families. We're going to have a large lobby and event space. We're going to have office space for the museum staff and for the Arboretum staff. So the Arboretum staff and the museum staff will be together in the building. As many of you may know, the Arboretum staff aren't all together. They're sort of dispersed throughout buildings on the campus. And we're going to have back of house support spaces, of course, including a dedicated loading dock, uh, collections uh, areas, art holding areas, a workshop, matting and framing room, uh, things of that nature that we need to operate the museum. Um, quickly, I want to talk to you about some of the precedents um, that we've been looking at for the new museum. So this is part of the process that we've been going through in developing the program, the program for the museum. And this includes an extensive amount of benchmarking with peer institutions and with museums that we aspire to. So we look to other academic art museums and their space program to inform our decision making and as examples of inspirational architecture. So for example, in my slide, I'm showing you precedence of a lobby. Yale, Chazen Museum, and the and University of Michigan. Um, excuse me, University of Minnesota, the Weissman Art Museum. So we're looking at you know, how big are their lobbies? How many visitors do they serve each year? We want to make sure that we right size the lobby space, right? Because I can tell you after 25 years in this business, <laughs> it's really important to get the visitor services spaces right. You don't want to build a museum, and then you open its doors, and you realize the lobby's too small, <laughs> and it can't accommodate everyone. So we're taking a close look at that. Another example, teaching gallery. For the first time, we will have a teaching gallery in the museum. Teaching galleries have become the staple of any academic art museum in this country. They are a hybrid classroom gallery space, and they provide a responsive pedagogical program for the university. The teaching gallery will allow us to more intentionally work with students and faculty and engage them in the collections and the life of the museum. Teaching galleries are truly collaborative spaces where faculty and students can select works of art in the collection as part of the course content. 
So this works of our, our, from our collection that can convey and investigate key course concepts for faculty here at Penn State. We're also planning an object study room that will be designed to accommodate experiential engagement with students and faculty with objects in our collection. It will allow our educational and curatorial staff and faculty across disciplines to actively teach with works of art in our collection, from works on paper to three-dimensional objects that are typically in storage. So this is where we get to bring the works that are in storage out of the vault and share it with the students and faculty. Um, we are also studying precedents for art museums in a landscape context including building mass. This has been, become a very important part of our conversation. And I'm showing you three of what we consider to be really the prime precedents for museums in a landscape setting. And that includes, of course, the Clark Art Institute, Crystal Bridges of American Art, and the newly opened Glenstone Museum in Potomac, Maryland. And Dave Cavanaugh and I were just discussing Glenstone, and he has been there uh, recently um, to visit. These buildings are generally, in terms of building mass, they lie low to the earth. They're one-story buildings or two-story buildings, and that is about as high as they get. You see taller museum buildings in an urban context. So again, we're studying these very carefully. Here's some, another example, again, of buildings integrated with landscape and have done it successfully. So here you see windows that frame unique views of gardens and landscape and provide visitors the opportunity to pause to reflect, to refresh, right, before you go on into your next gallery. They become very important part of, again, this museum in a landscape setting. So let's go back to our existing conditions in that site boundary line I showed you earlier. So think about the precedents that I just spoke about and that I showed you the images of. This, this circle here, is the canvas, imagine it as a canvas, that the architect Allied Works and Reed Hildebrand, a landscape architect, are using to create a compelling, creative, and functional design that meets the goals of the project. And after four months of developing a variety of conceptual design and siting options for the new art museum, today I'm revealing to you for the first time we are moving forward with, drum roll please, <laughs> We are moving forward with the connector concept for the new art museum. You are seeing it here in a digital rendering to convey building mass, stacking, and site location. Now, a word on conceptual design for those of you who aren't familiar with it. This is the phase of the project where we take the pre-designed work, the program study, the goals that I mentioned, the benchmarking, and the site conditions, and we establish the overarching vision for the building. So the conceptual design provides the design direction for the project and it commu and communicates it through these conceptual sketches. The connector concept has, we feel, the greatest potential to reach into the Arboretum and create a sense of integration that is one of the primary goals of the project. The connector concept provides the greatest opportunity to connect art with nature, and it's a design that's going to continually remind our visitors of the natural setting. The connector, as you can see from my slide, is a one to two story building. It's an appropriate scale, right, for a museum in a natural setting, yet it will have presence on park as conveyed in this image here. You can see the building mass as you would, be, as you would view it from park. So the connector concept allows for a lower building mass and a more gracious internal experience. I'm going to share with you another image. The museum's front entrance, this was another priority for the project, and especially for, for myself and for Kim Steiner, the director of the Arboretum, is that we have to prioritize access for pedestrians and for people coming out of their, their cars. And that means you have to have access, easy access to the Arboretum. So as you can see, we're gonna have this opening um, that goes straight into the Arboretum. So here's the connector. That's the bridge that connects the two buildings and you can walk underneath it having a central open entry into the Botanic Gardens. So this is the through plaza. This is where you'll have 24 seven access into the Arboretum. So we're not blocking access, we're keeping it open. 
And now let's look at the building diagrammatically. Galleries, as you can see, are going to be located to the north. Visitor services are going to be at center, aligned with the main entrance. And the education wing and administrative offices will be to the south toward park. The museum will have a distinct entry. It'll have an event terrace, a sculpture courtyard, and an education courtyard. Let's now take a view, again, that drone view, that aerial view um, of the building mass. So here is the building situated within the aerial view um, of the Arboretum. So again, you get a sense of building mass. So the connector concept, again, is providing us with a design direction. It's not a design, it's a concept. It provides the direction as we enter the next phase of the project, which is schematic design. And we just kicked off schematic design this past week. We had a big meeting in New York with Allied Works. So that's just getting started. Schematic design is where the concept turns into architecture. So during schematic design, Allied Works will create site plans, floor plans, elevations. You'll really get to see what this building is going to look like. So I can't tell you it's going to exactly look like this. But this is the idea. This is the vision. This is the overarching concept. Let's just briefly go over the project timeline. I just mentioned we finished the design concept. I guess going this way is better. Um, I'm right in the middle. Um, here we are in schematic, which we're kicking off right now. Um, design development is next. And then there is a board of trustee meeting in here somewhere. We have to go back to the board of trustees for final approval before we move into construction documents. We're hoping to break ground on the new museum a year from now. And the goal is that this new museum will open in January of 2023, just in time to celebrate 50 years of an art museum uh, at Penn State. So today, I'm going to end my presentation with some other conceptual digital renderings to get you excited about this project. These were created by Allied Works. And I like these because they demonstrate how Allied Works is helping us to achieve our goals for the project. The goal of integration with landscape, integration with the Arboretum and the gardens. The goal of creating an inviting and welcoming place that is accessible to all and enhances the visitor experience of the museum and the Arboretum. A museum that strengthens the connection between town and gown and a place for Penn State students that enhances their Penn State experience and expands their skills and world view. And an art museum that above all else advances Penn State's three-part mission of teaching, research, and public service. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. So I think while I'm right on time, that's good. <laughs> and I'm very happy to take some questions. Looking for Paul. He's going to pass around a microphone so everyone can hear the questions. We have one right here. Oh. Um, where do we park? <laughs> so can I go back for a minute? Is that? Okay, so you ready? So you're parking here. The parking lot behind cats will be the parking. And there'll be some parking adjacent to the museum, but the parking will be directly across from the main entrance of the museum, and it will be behind the cats building. There's a parking lot you all know there today. We're doing a parking study, and we're looking at, with the parking authority here at Penn State, converting part of that parking lot over to uh, parking for the Arboretum and the Art Museum. So that is part of this project. Was that a green roof I saw in the last uh, slide well, that you showed? Well, that's one of the ideas. It's not to say that it will happen or not, but it's one of the ideas. As you know, the green roofs have become very popular. Um, and uh, we are, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a consideration to have a green roof. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, and maybe even some kind of a rooftop terrace, something like that, is also something that we're looking at. I like that idea. You like that idea. Okay, she, she said she likes that idea. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> I do too. So we're gonna, we'll have to see if we, can, if we can include it in the budget. We will. 
Yes. Erin, what yeah. happens to the existing Palmer Museum when you move out of there? Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Great question. I get that a lot, actually. So the existing Palmer Museum on Curtin Road, um, first and foremost, I want everyone here in the room to know, it'll always be referred to as the Palmer Building. Those naming rights that Jim and Barbara Palmer secured back in 1993 remain with that building. Whatever its use ends up building, it will be known as the Palmer Building. What will it be used for? A task force has been assembled by Bill Sitzeby, the Associate Vice President of Physical Plant, and they are right now reviewing proposals for the, the, the building and for its use, but I can tell you it will be a student-focused space. So the building will be for students. That's all I can tell you right now. Stay tuned. <laughs> I, I've seen some of the proposals, very, some very interesting ideas, but again, it's going to be all for students. We are vacating the building, as you know. so. Um, we're taking everything with us. <laughs> so any more questions? Yes. We'll get that microphone to you. Are you, are you thinking of any public transportation to the new art museum? Yes. Right now, a student can walk in present the uh, museum very easily, anytime, right. walk in. Yes. But the new one is a little bit far away to walk. Right. And if the student has to drive their cars, it's very troubles, uh, cumbersome. Yes, so there will be, we are looking at that as part of this project. We are looking at shuttles, the bus will go there. I believe the shuttle already goes there now. Yeah, they go there now, so transport public transportation already goes to the Arboretum, so we're gonna make sure that we have even more of that <laughs> available for students to get to, to easily get to the Arboretum, and that's a great question, and that's, uh, that's a top priority um, as we are looking at accessibility for this project. How can I learn about present the shuttle, which you mentioned? How, about what? Oh, kata.com. Kata.com. No, I am talking about shuttle. You mentioned the pre even present shuttle goes to the yes. uh, the arboretum. How can I find the schedule? There's also an app. Okay. So the sports museum is in Beaver Stadium, as, as you know. So I think here we'll be closer to the sports museum at the Arboretum than we currently are now. So um, does, that, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, so, so, so that's a great question. So yes, let me address that. So the broader vision that I outlined from the 2016 fe feasibility study for the full build out of this cultural destination as Dr. Barron envisions it, right? That, I don't believe it included the sports museum. I think the sports museum, there are other reasons or priorities at work that they want to stay in Beaver Stadium, but of course that could change, right? Because things change, right? And, we're, and as you can see, we, we flip the phasing, right? We, we, we have already, this project has evolved. So I can't say to you today that that wouldn't happen. It very well could, I mean, but I don't believe it was included in the full build out. But thank you. Thank you all so much. Go Nittany Lions. <laughs> Have a great day.